Hello everybody, ciao a tutti and welcome to Art When We Speak. Today I will guide you in a watercolor practice and we are going to uh, review some nice technique that you can use to sketch in preparation of a painting. As I was reading some of your comments, I noticed that you really enjoy this practice with watercolor in which we sketch with a pencil, we paint with watercolors and then we can like support and enhance the design with some nice uh, outlines and uh, just to support uh, the texture and the value in our pictures. For this practice, you need a watercolor paper. If you have your journal, use your journal. If you don't, use a watercolor paper or a very, very good mix and media paper. The result of mix and media paper might be a little different than in watercolor papers, but you can do it. Remember that the process is more important than the project. If you're understanding what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it, it's a success. Then a pencil for drawing and an eraser if you need to erase, but I don't think that you will. Watercolor, any brand that you have available, and you if ever sorry, every any brand that you have available. And if you don't have as many colors as I have, remember that we mix and we make colors. So mixing primary with secondary gives you tertiary, and you can mix the tertiary with secondary to get even more tertiary colors. You have some gray, you can do some tones. You have some white, you can create tint. And if you have the black, you will create the shade of the colors. If you're new to this channel, consider to practice also with my previous practice and to subscribe to my channel and like my video. Let me know, you know, your experience in the comments. Let me know if you have any question and click on the little bell so you will be notified every time that I come up with a new video, which is usually once per week, a long practice and then some shorts here and there. I'm going to switch the camera so you read the description box where I put all the list of the materials that you need for the practice, post the video, and then once you're ready, we practice together or you can watch the video and then practice at your own convenience. Okay, here we are. I'm working with my usual watercolor journal. You will be working with your watercolor paper and let's start to set the sketch before we paint. And we are focusing on creating like a simple bucolic uh, landscape uh, featuring a countryside, maybe a barn, a farm, something like that. And we are going to focus on the illusion of space. So we have different technical device, devices for create an illusion of space. So we start with extremely light and a little irregular uh, line of the horizon, right? So we kind of set for us the ground above which we are going to start to display different elements. So I'm going to start to sketch the bar, two parallel lines. Then we're going to do a trapezoid type of roof. You can do it differently if you have, you know, maybe you know a barn that you love, that you want to, you know, take a picture of that and sketch that. Or if you know it's shaped by memories, you can go. I'm doing like a sort of a sketch from memory. I don't have any images in front of me that I'm specifically looking at. I know that the pencil now shows very light, but it is important as I say to my students in school, that we learn how to measure, like moderate the pressure of our hands on the paper. We don't really want a lot of pressure because we don't want to commit to extremely dark lines. So we want to really have a, just a sketch that will give us the guidance to painting on top of this sketch and make this paper so beautiful and colorful. I'm setting sort of a implied texture for my barn. So I'm doing simple horizontal lines. Once again, they don't have to be geometrically perfect. This is not what we are doing here. We are not doing architectural design. And then you can leave it the way it is. Or if you want to have like a, the plank of the wood, you will do more or less what you will do when you create a brick uh, pattern, just like a these segmented lines that I'm doing vertically, they are like farther apart because the plank are pretty long, right? Compared to the brick. Nice. Once again, doesn't have to look perfect. 
or anything like that. So I think I will add a nice tree here next to the barn to fill the space because we say that, you know, it is important to fill the space to create a beautiful, united and uh, harmonic piece with balance that doesn't have to be a symmetric balance. In this case, you won't, you will see, but we want to add element. And look what I'm doing. I'm scribbling to represent the implied texture of this tree. Okay. Then on this side, I'm going to draw a fence once again doesn't have to be perfect. Actually, the imperfection creates such a better landscape because they, you know, they add, we add interest. To the piece, a little bit of bush in here. It's gonna create some implied texture in front of the entrance of the barn, tiny little like oval scribbling. Maybe here we can, to create a better illusion of the space, this is our foreground. So whatever we put here, it's going to be bigger in comparison to other element and maybe a little more detail. So in this case, since we can say that this is the uh, point for the perspective, we're going to add a little bit of perspective, right? To also drive the attention to the barn, which is the focal point of this piece. So rectangle, then two diagonal parallel, you close it. Back is very, very light. Maybe we can add plants, gardens. So I'm going to do the net for the tomatoes. <laughs> And you can scribble plants, scribble, and close it once again. If you want to give it some texture to represent maybe the plank of the wood, you would do so. Then we're going to have another one here. Same, try to do same size. Once again, doesn't have to be perfect. And then here, maybe before we close it on the back, we can do different type of support for our plan. We scribble, 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 and we close the back. Hmm? We can create some texture on the ground, also setting some sort of a cast of shadow, right? So when we paint on top with the watercolor, we will still have this nice texture from the pencil. We can do one in the back. It's slightly smaller because we are going back to the horizon and then to the middle and foreground. So remember that sizes and position are both very important devices that we can use to create illusion of space in our pictures, right? And then here I will just put probably salad or some sort of veggie. You close it in the back, a little bit of texture over here, and maybe you can leave it like that. If you wanna add another, it's gonna take this position it's going to be slightly smaller than this one because it's more distance, right? We're going to do once again, a little perspective, imply texture, and different plants, a different type of scribble. Hmm? We're going to add some nice texture. And we set. Now we work going into our foreground. So maybe we can have a nice hill in the background and when we will have our crops so we can have fun, 
coloring different type of green or brown, whatever we want that to be. I'm going to add some trees and plants and bushes always, you know, in the background. So as you can see, they're not as big as the tree. They're not as detailed as the tree because they are farther, right? So in the back, we're going to go one more hill. And then once again, we are going to put some trees on top of this one. And as you can see, even smaller than this one. So once again, sizes, proportion and position are going to help us to uh, define the space in our paper and give us that illusion, right, of space. In these pictures, for this picture specifically, I will use the technique that we use in the past, in which we set, we sketch before, and then we are going to paint with watercolor. This is going to be a tree. Very, very different and much, much, much smaller. And here we're going to add the different type of trees. Like, you know, there, there is a little forest of some sort. I'm just scribbling the lines. And that's it. So now we set, uh, maybe we can create a texture on the other side that amplify actually this linear perspective, right? Our focal point is definitely the barn, which is surrounded by other elements. That is not symmetry because it is not another shape similar to the other side. However, the space is well, ba is well balanced, right? Because you have these bigger shapes and figures, but then we have a lot of interest, uh, a lot of movement going on over here. And these trees will balance this one and this one. Here is bigger and closest to us. So these are farther apart or smaller, but we put three. So they balance. Now we get ready to paint with the watercolor. So prep your water, your brushes and any watercolor that you have available. And then we start. Okay, I'm going to start to set my brown. Remember that if you don't have many, many colors available, you can mix primary with secondary, secondary with tertiary, and so on and on. And you can create your beautiful, interesting palette. Now, we already discussed the challenge of finding the right amount of water for our project. In this case, I would say you need to control the watercolor. You don't want them to blend too much. You want to feel the shapes that you traced before. So I would say just the right amount of water that is going to help you to spread the colors, in a, you know, but also control them. Now we're going to see that with colors and intensity, we can also enhance and support the illusion of space. So usually we have more intense colors, right, close to the foreground because we perceive them more. They are closest to our eyes. So, and then lighter, less intense and less bright as we go. In, if we move into the middle ground and background. Although this is not, you know, right for the sky, the sky, let's say that if you have like mostly a sunset sky, you will have a beautiful, very warm and intense colors also on the background. Now, let's see. I'm going to do a sort of a bluish for my barn you can do you remember that playing with color getting to know the color and choosing the color that you want for your piece it's something is a self-exploration right so i want you to kind of follow what you want to don't follow my uh, lead unless it's exactly what you want to do we're gonna carefully and with not too much water, well, because maybe you don't want to lose the texture that you created with a pencil. But remember that we are going to 
go over with extra fine permanent markers to retrieve our nice details and our textures if you want to do so. Now I'm going to add just a little bit of water. I don't want the blue to be all the same, so I want it to be a little more intense here, a little less, also because we create the illusion that the light hit the piece, right? In a different way. And so colors change according to the reaction, the reaction of the surface with the light. There we go. Yes, I'm going to create another brown. I would like a little lighter than this one and also sort of a, a tone. There you go, a little darker. I will use this one for the door. Remember that when we use watercolor, mostly if you're a beginner, if we have accident that happen because the color bleed into another or whatever, let's embrace it. You know, we don't throw anything away. We keep working on the piece until it's all done and we learn for future practices. We don't really throw anything. Sometimes if you want a very light tone, you just dip the brush again in the water without adding any more color. I'm going to dip into the different type of brown, a little warmer than I use over here to create some interest. And then I'm going to pick some red, controlling the amount of water. So tap it on the piece of paper or on a plastic palette if you have it. Because in this one, you want to control, you don't want it to bleed. But once again, if that happens, it's absolutely fine. I'm going to actually bring a little bit of red, reddish tone here as well. There we go. Now I'm going to go to onto the tree. I want to mix new brown for it. Once again, we control it, not too much water, we have fun, we don't add too much pressure, we barely touch the paper and we kind of even try sort of scribbling with the brush, right? Lose it up, don't control it too much, have fun. And once again, we're going to follow, we're going to embrace what happened. Expand that. We can have a nice green mix over here because we have a lot of brownish colors. So if you want to make it a little more vivacious and bright, we're going to start with some light green. You dark it up. You know, we don't want to have a one single color for everything, right? So once again, my green might be a little more, a little, you know, more intense on the foreground and then a little less in the background. I like to mix, mix a color and see what happens. You mix color in the palette or you mix color on the paper. Make sure that your brush is wet enough for you to use it uh, nicely without any struggle on the paper. If you think that you're struggling with the brush on the paper, it means that probably you need to use a little bit more water. You gently go on top. Then remember that we are covering up some of the texture, but we are going to remake them with the extra fine um, markers. So we just now here setting the first coat of colors. If you're not using too much water also, and if you're using a good quality, a decent quality watercolor paper, um, you should be, the watercolor should dry pretty quickly. Now I'm gonna go back to a sort of brownish because as I say, I don't want my ground to look all the same, to look too, 
perfect. We want to add There you go. Remember, the most important thing is that we're going to have fun, right? Then for the caster shadow, you can uh, add a sort of a, like a grayish tone. You can have like a, you can dark up the area between uh, the gardens, beds, right? Here. Also, because as we say, this is what we have in our foreground. So we want it to be and to look darker overall. And these goldish colors. You can mix the yellow with the green for a lighter green. And intense and bright. If you think that your brush is too wet, always, always, always. Tap it on the piece of paper or tap it on the palette before moving on to the paper. We're going to set to the background. We want to have a little darker over here. And then we're going to use some of the brown to make it even darker. Now I'm going to retrieve the brown that I use for this one because actually we're going to bring this brown as well on the back. Go over. And now again, we play with some green. Have fun. You know what veggie are you doing? This one, since they are very tiny, you want to really focus on the control that you have on the water and on the pressure, right? If you press too much, you're going to kind of let the color bleed in, and this is not what you want necessarily. So in this case, I'm just, you know, wetting the brush a little bit, but working up. I'm going to have a, like a some darker green. This one instead, we're going to kind of do it almost yellowish. Let's see. And we play with darker and lighter tones, right? Because it makes everything much better. It creates more variety. You can start to do some texture. Now I'm going to grab a little bit of black and this one is something that you can do with the watercolors right now or you will do later with a permanent marker if you don't feel like. I just really going over the lines that we trace at the beginning with a pencil just to retrieve the texture and the shape of the garden bed. I am dipping really just the tip of my brush in the water and then into the black and then very carefully. Going over. And we let everything set and marinate over here. 
I'm going to actually create a little bit more texture, like a grass. And look what I'm doing very simply, right? I dip just the tip of the brush into the water. I am working with a pretty dark green, almost no water at all. When you feel that you start to struggle, which means that you find too much resistance on the paper with the brush, you're going to dip it in more water. I'm going to just do few, like a really tiny little vertical and diagonal strokes that will give us the illusion of grass. And remember that since this is the foreground, which is the closest part to us, we really want to add some details that we won't add in the background because we are focusing on the illusion of space. And how can we create, we can successfully create a three-dimensional landscape, right? This aerial perspective and linear perspective as well. So the pieces that we paint don't look so flat, but they have some dimension, right? And the eyes of the viewer, when they look at your piece, can kind of navigate through and wander through the picture. Sometimes we don't have to do it. It depends on what we are painting and what is the feeling that we want to have, right? If you want to do something a little more realistic or impressionistic, this is a good technique that I'm teaching you. But sometimes if you want to do something, uh, you know, whimsical, you really don't care about the perspective and the rules, right? As we always say, we learn them and we learn how to use them. But then we also free ourselves in every time that we feel that we want to break them because we have a different intention for our pieces. Not all of our pieces needs to be perfectly realistic or a re real representation of that. It could be, you know, whatever you feel like doing it. It's just a good, good exercise for our fine motor skills. We exercise the pressure of the brush. We exercise many beautiful things, you know, that we will learn, many beautiful skills that you will learn in the future. So now I think that I will do the crops behind it, and then we are going to uh, do the rest. So I want to be creative. I want to have a little bit of orange on the back. just to break the, the green. Then we're gonna go also with the green on top. This time I'm wetting my brush a little more. We don't need to control it, right? We're going to go over and we don't need to control it as much as we were controlling it for smaller details. So just a little bit more water that will allow you to go a long way without having to dip the brush over and over again. You set the edge, you go very nicely behind. Wet the brush again, pick a little bit more of the green that you're using, and you're doing the same on the other side. I'm going to paint the edge, and then I will spread the color down. Don't worry if you go over the lines that we trace for the fence. We are going to retrieve everything at the very end. Once the whole piece is dry, and we can retrieve some of the details and the texture with our markers. I'm just like leaving out the holes of the fence so I know where they are. Now I'm going to switch again. I'm going to make it with a dark green. I'm going to mix it with the other. And then I will go first in this like first like stripes that I trace. I'm kind of scribbling with my brush. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing fancy or difficult. 
Sometimes we get intimidated by painting something because we think that we need to paint the whole thing. But actually, no, it's a repetition of strokes when you paint or simple element when you're drawing and that will give you the illusion, right, of a texture, the illusion of an element that you are representing. Now with the lighter green, I will go and fill the gaps. And remember, in this case, if it bleeds a little bit, it's even better. You use it until you feel that you can move your brush smoothly on the paper. When you start to encounter some, you know, persistence, you can add deep in the water again, deep in the green again, and you keep doing what I'm doing. Fill the gaps. And keep it going. We want it to be lighter, so use it. Maybe dip it just in the water, in the green, and then finish your piece. Fill the gaps so we don't want it to be too perfect or precise, and that's it. We keep painting now the plants and the bushes and the hills in the background. I'm going to change the color palette just to make it something that, you know with a little more variety. I mix in some of like the green with the light orange and then once again you can use one color to paint between the very light line that we traced before with the pencil and then another color to fill the gaps a little more come and dip it Also, what I would like for you to notice is that when we sketch for a painting, it's something different than drawing, right? When we draw something that we know that we are going to completely do and realize with pencils or drawing media, we are going to add all the details, we are going to add all the shading, everything, right? When you sketch instead for a painting, you just want to sketch the important lines and outlines to set for yourself like you know the spaces that you want to take care of uh, so when you paint uh, sometimes you don't follow exactly what you sketched sometimes you can go over you can make some changes or you can really follow the sketch the sketch is something that doesn't feature any shading any value anything in particular because everything will happen then with painting in this case with watercolors but even if you do acrylics even more right and usually I like you know watercolors give me the flexibility to um, work also with the extra fine markers at the end which is a technique that I really really like and I feel that gives you wonderful result and make your pieces look so uh, visually appealing and so nice so but if you want to leave it as it is as a watercolor painting, of course, you will have to, at that point, work on texture and value with the paintbrush and the watercolor, right? Because we want to make sure that we still show a nice variety. So now here I mix in a couple of green. As we say, we don't want the piece to look flat and boring, right? We want to make it visually interesting. Now, remember what we did for the grass over here. If you want, you can do it the same. In that case, remember that you're going to just dip the tip of the brush in the water and then try to control the amount of water. And we can add some texture.
you see you kind of just barely touch the paper and do these tiny tiny little strokes so that requires a little like you know fine motor skills on coordination at the beginning it might be a little challenging but keep doing it because as i say the practice makes a huge difference and we're always focused on the process more than the final products sometimes we are not going to be satisfied by the final products it's fine because we did the practice and through the practice we had an amazing experience and we learn and we train our skills so the next practice will be more and more successful right we need to be patient and now i'm gonna grab i'm gonna pick a little bit of reddish brownish so i can do the branch and the trunk of this tree and those trees as well a little more over here and here and then we're gonna do different type of green once again You just tap the brush, you see I'm tapping and letting the water work its magic. Then I'm going to take a little darker green. And if you don't have so many green, remember that you can mix yellow with the green to make it lighter and brighter. You can mix uh, instead a gray, or a little bit of black to create a darker green and so you create a shade or a tone you see we want to have some variety and i'm gonna use what is left over on my brush for this tree and i will use probably the same type of green to do part of this tree extremely like a dark when it you know it's the bottom of the tree and between the branches and then i will light it up I'm gonna add just a little bit of water without picking the color again and I will spread I will spread this green always with these very small touches and strokes right we pull it up bring it up and then we are going to rinse the brush and pick a lighter green and use it for the top right because the top of the trees usually since they heat they are heated by the light more right than between the branches they feature lighter tones and tints of green we're gonna go between gonna blend them nicely gonna also let some of the green bleed inside our um barn and then finally i will go with gray grayish color uh, and a little bit of water on top of uh you know the poles of our fence once again go slow control your hands when you think that the color is becoming too light you're gonna deep in the color again avoid the, to dip the water in the water too much because you want to really control this time if you don't feel ready to do these details with your hands, with your brush, sorry, you can wait and you can do it afterwards with a black extra fine uh, marker. But if you feel ready, you go for it. And even if you mess it up, it's fine. now i need one final touch of green before we move on to the sky i'm gonna do nice i'm gonna use nice and bright green and actually i'm gonna use some of these leftover to complete the shading also on this tree I'm gonna go the way bring it down 
have some nice shading on top. We are adding some nice shadow, right? Because we want value, which is a value pattern when we switch from a darker to a lighter, you know, that creates a lot of interest. The watercolor dries so quickly that they give us the opportunity to rework on top of the same area. If you have a very good quality, you don't have to worry about the paper breaking. If you don't have a, you know, a good quality of watercolors, you might be a little more careful because the paper can actually break easily, right? I'm gonna get some brown and I'm going to kind of go over first spaces that we painted at the beginning of this exercise, just because they are now dry and they allow me some shading, some nice, you know, texture that you wanna add in. When we add a variety of texture and a nice value pattern, all the pieces that we create, they become a more interesting and more interactive also, right? So the viewer eyes can go from one side to the other, can, you know, indulge in the color palettes that you've chosen. And things that don't have to look plain or perfect, on the contrary, on the contrary. Now, if you want to retouch a little bit the garden, do so. Once again, you pick a different tones of green, lighter and darker, and you go back when you see white spot that you want to fulfill, right? You blend the colors together and then you pick a lighter one. You go back over. Then I wanna actually have some red with a very little amount of water and I'm gonna do just a few dots, right? Like for tomatoes, for some veggie. So we create some visual variety, right? Nice. If you wanna do so, also on the grass, to create that optical illusion of flowers, do so. If you don't wanna do them uh, red, if you wanna do them another color, feel free to do so as well. Maybe. Here and here. Now, if you want a bigger brush to do the sky, you can do so. I don't think that I will go for a sunset sky just because I use a very bright, intense and pretty light palette. Usually when you have a sunset on the back, everything will look darker, right? Because you have the light coming from the back. So I want to do a very nice, a very light blue sky like the ones that I get to enjoy today here in Saratoga Springs, Utah, where I am located. The weather is finally gorgeous. And in this case, my friends, instead, we want to have a lot of water. So you will brush, you will dip the brush in the water and then dip it in the color, then in the water again. And you want to make sure that you can spread it out nicely and smoothly. And when you feel the brush is getting too uh, dry, pick the water again, color again, water again and you will do the same and it's nice to have some darker and lighter blue as well remember that you're going to blend the colors all together of course if you want to do a sunset to go for it you will pick like a hot pink orangey palette for that you will have to do some more blending but you will also have to dark up the palette, the, the color palette of the, you know, the painting just to be accurate, right? We are careful when we go next to the, near the other element that we paint, but also once again, if you bleed a little bit, it's totally fine, totally fine.
between the trees. Now nice and smoothly. Maybe it's a little hard over here. And what I like to do, maybe you pick a little bit of pink, you mix it to that light blue, then you know we can go on top with some uh, with a still a pretty wet brush, not everywhere, but you know to create also a little variety in the sky as well. Some pinkish tones. We can make our background very gentle and nice and create some variety in the color palette. Very serene, very tranquil scene. And then you can use any brand of uh, extra fine permanent markers that you have available and you have to wait and try for the painting to be dry if you do it on the wet uh, side of your painting uh, the markers is not expanding or bleeding because it's permanent however you risk uh, to ruin uh, the design and also to break the paper so just let's make sure that whenever you work it's basically dry and then very gently exactly as we did with the pencil right because when we sketch we don't want to have a perfect line but we want to have a multiple dynamic lines a segmented right nice you're gonna do maybe details you can add the textures that you want and you need super light and you kind of retrieve some of the outlines that we did at the beginning remember that you don't want them to look perfect on the contrary you know we want everything to look nice and you know just a sketch. You can add some texture to the plant if you wish to do so. Just to amplify the texture that we created painting. Now, this passage, you don't have to do it if you're content with the way your painting look before, you just leave it as it is. However, you can do this type of practice with me to also compare right a uh, different design what happened when you do these black outlines at the end and what happened when you don't so you kind of individualize the best technique that fulfill your artistic desires and needs and also that the best technique for a specific work that maybe you know it's not going to work at all for others but you want to make sure that you do some experiment right so for the grass the same i won't go over the whole thing but i will just like a go around the corner where i want to amplify and support the texture that i created before the same for the line of the horizon nice segmented very let's do it like that because the sky is still you see some scribble for the trees here and there. I would do some texture like that. And then we go up and I would work a little bit, some nice scribbling line on the branches of my trees. I would support the texture of the tree just a little bit. Like that you're gently scratching on the paper, right? You are reframing. You 
the shapes that you painted. You add as much or as little as you want. And for the texture that remember that we create, you can just go back and retrieve the lines that you trace at the beginning with the pencil. You can leave it like that, or you can do. I think I'm gonna leave it like that without doing the uh, the plank, you know, the vertical lines. I think that it looks, you know very nice because we have a uh, multiple lines moving in this picture the same is for the uh, fence as you see very nice losing up not imprecise a quick resketch We want to do a little texture, a few of our holes. We go up to our second line once again. It's really like a sort of an extra support for the design. We don't want to do it too much because we don't want to really cover the beautiful, beautiful things that we created with watercolors. We just want to enhance the uh, shapes and the value of things. And when you think that you have enough texture, that you're happy, that everything looks uh, unified and harmonic, For me, it's always so surprising, right, that, that with simple basic elements such as lines and scribbled, honestly, we can uh, create optical illusion of a nice, nice landscape. Sometimes, as I say, we feel intimidated because we think that we have to paint every single element. But then, in reality, it's a matter of strokes, it's a matter of lines, you know, and very simple elements that they get repeated and repeated and together they create you know an optical illusion of something you see i'm doing like tiny little dots to create some more interest on this background this hill and the crops that i'm you know painting you see it's like nice and it doesn't look perfect you can do some dots here and there a few more dots in here Very simple, don't overdo it. It's difficult to know when we are done sometimes, right? Some students ask, how do I know that I'm done? Well, it's just a feeling. You make sure that you painted every detail so that there is a value, so alternation of darker and lighter spot, that there is variety and also like a, a, a nice balance. And for me, that's it. I wouldn't want to add anything else, probably just here a little bit more in the corner of our barn. It's been an extremely relaxing practice, uh, uh, very liberating, honestly. Um, and I hope that it was the same for you guys. I'm going to switch the camera so we can say goodbye. And uh, I hope that you really enjoyed as much as I did. Okay, guys, we are at the end of this nice practice together. This is the um, bucolic uh, countryside uh, 
landscape that we created together. We review beautiful like a technique for sketching in preparation of a painting, the difference between sketching and drawing, how to really create a unified and balanced uh, landscape, uh, taking care of foreground, middle ground and background, and what type of tools, visual tools and visual devices that we can use to create an illusion of space and like an aerial uh, perspective using also linear perspective. We say that positions matters, the size of things matters, overlapping matters because drive our eyes uh, toward the horizon and toward the background, basically. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I see you all very soon with another beautiful practice. So make sure to subscribe to my channel if you like this practice. Let me know uh, in your comment if you have any questions, or if you would like to have some support in other practices as well. And I see you all very soon. Ciao a tutti!